Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, about two weeks ago, I was, I was just kind of, actually, I just woke up and I was laid in bed, kind of sitting there. You know how sometimes you lay in bed, just kind of, you're vegging? Anybody ever veg first thing in the morning? Not really, you know, not really, you know, just kind of, uh, and I heard these words, Egypt ain't all that. And, uh, and I knew, you know, and then I began to kind of lay, lay hold of that and understood Lord, what the Lord was talking to me about. And uh, so it was a sermon title. <clears throat> so today we got a sermon. Egypt just ain't all that. Now, don't get upset. Don't be offended if you're in Egypt or if you're an Egyptian. It's, it's in reference to the, the symbolic meaning of Egypt. And then that is the place where Israel came out of the place of sin. Where Israel came out of the place of bondage and captivity. And so that, that is the reference point to this. It is not about modern day Egypt. You know, I'm not trying to make a statement about that. We probably could, but we're not going to. Hallelujah. This is in reference in biblical terminology and in biblical reference and allegory about the place where Israel came out of bondage. All right. So everybody say that Egypt just ain't all that. Hallelujah. All right. <clears throat> so we know the story. You know, God talked to Abraham and told him that the, people, the nation of Israel would go into captivity. They did for 400 years. And after 400 years of bondage, he raised up a deliverer. And, uh, you know, and I love the movie, The Ten Commandments by Cecil B. DeMille. Um, you know, and I love all the cool stuff in it. You know, I've got the Blu-ray special edition, whatever anniversary it is, in the back package where you, you take it out and play it out. And when you open it up, you've got the little Ten Commandments that slide out so you can get the DVDs and stuff out. It's a numbered, it's a numbered set. It's really, really, really cool. All right? Love the movie. It's just biblically inaccurate in so many ways. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of accuracy, and then there's a lot of inaccuracy. I mean, you know, let me give you the first one. When they come out of the nation of Egypt, and they got them on stretchers, and they're blind, and they can't, and they're carrying it ain't what happened. It's the 135th Psalm said, that, or 107th Psalm, what is it? It's the 135th Psalm. It says, you know, 119, 135, I think. Yep. They, they all, there was no feeble one among them. They all came out healed. Hallelujah. So just so you know, they're, they're, you know, anyway. <clears throat> but I do love, I love, the, you know, the storyline was a biblically based storyline. And, you know, when you kind of go back here. So let's go back. We want to parallel a little bit uh, the church or Christians, Christianity, with uh, the nation of Israel and the nation of Egypt. And I understand this. The Bible tells us in a couple of different places that the things that happened to Israel were done and the things that they went through are in samples or examples to us. In other words... Regardless of what people say about you just don't do anything with the Old Testament stuff, the Bible tells us to study and look out and figure out what they did so we don't do it. Amen. Now, I, don't, I can't help what so-and-so teaches. I know what the Bible says. And whatever so-and-so teaches, if they don't teach what the Bible says, I don't listen to so-and-so. All right? I don't care how many letters they got behind their name. Amen. Amen? Like Dad Hagen said one time, he was listening to somebody teach, and they had a Ph.D. He said after listening to them teach for a while, he finally figured out Ph.D. meant post hole digger. Because the post hole digger got more sense than that. Okay? So anyway, that was a joke. I'm going to get a laughing machine. Just like being in corny sitcoms. You're going to have all that canned laughter. Hallelujah. All right. So, you know, they're in, Egypt, they're in bondage. Moses comes. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. He says, forget it, dude. I'm not letting them go. And after all the plagues come, you know, and, and, and then the death angel comes. And finally they get up, they know, and, and then they, they go to the, all the people and say, we, uh, we want to borrow some money. We want to borrow some clothes. And they're just giving them everything for a three-day journey. They're supposed to go three days out and worship. Remember? They give them all the clothes. They give them the gold. They just load them up, man. You know what? Get out of here. We're tired of having you guys around. I mean, you know, you're causing us a lot of trouble. We're fed up with it. So here we have in Exodus chapter um, 12. Can somebody get these? These are, I don't know how, what happened. Hallelujah, they're kind of foggy. So Exodus 12, 51, it says, And it came to pass the selfsame day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. All right. So God brought the children of Israel out. Now this is a, this is a type of the church or, or of individuals coming out of bondage into the liberty of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And we know what happens. They come out, they go, and they march up, and they get to the Red Sea. And when they get to the Red Sea, Pharaoh, by, in the meantime, decides, you know what? Uh, this is a bad idea. Uh, letting them go, I mean, we don't have any brick makers. We don't have any slave labor. I mean, our economy just tanked and it went into the toilet. You know, and so he sends his armies out after them, and they come up behind them, and they are trapped between Pharaoh's armies and the Red Sea. And, um, you know, and then, you know, they, people start crying. You know, they're, they're uh, you know... 
it amazes me how people can see all the miracles and power and wonders of God and then turn around two weeks later and forget about it all. Forget all the goodness of God. God does miracles, and three weeks later they get into another situation. Oh, what am I going to do? Well, the same God that delivered you three weeks ago is still around. You know, uh, uh, Annie, Annie uh, Durant used to sing with the Raymond Singers of Man, and she, she oh, Pastor Hagen loves, he'll do it again. You know? Just like Moses. You know, you know and, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, he'll do it again. Anyway, I'm not even, I should stop. I should stop before I got started. You know, God will show up on the scene every time you need him to show up when you step out and believe by, believe by faith. So they get there. People start crying. You know, you know, God sends a pillar of fire there and stops them all. There's a, so the Lord's been camped between the Pharaoh's armies, the children of Israel, and they're stuck between that and the Red Sea. <clears throat> Moses talks to the Lord. The Lord says, stretch out your rod over the sea. Look at these, these, uh, these stiff necks. He don't know if he said it right here and there, but, you know, he's probably thinking it because that's what they are. And uh, say, stand, you still see the salvation of God. Amen? And then God sends the wind overnight, splits the sea. And, you know, the Bible actually tells us he congealed it. He froze it, stood it up. They went over on dry ground. When Pharaoh's armies were saved to do so, they were drowned in the midst of the sea. Okay? So, <clears throat> here we have uh, Israel being brought out. Miracles delivering them. Even right after they came out, they were in a tough place. God delivered them. How many of you went through things like that as individuals? You came out of... You came out of the world, you faced difficult things right after you came out, and God was doing miracles right and left, things were happening, and you're just, oh, praise God. This is our game going to tell him, God did this and God did that. Man, you were so happy to be delivered from sin and be happy to be delivered from the world, happy to be delivered from drugs, happy to be delivered from alcohol, happy to be delivered from sin. You just, I mean, you couldn't keep you out of church. <clears throat> we're going to have a four-week revival. You're there early every time. Amen. Amen. Telling everybody about it. We're having a, you know, a four-week revival. Now some folks go, my God, the pastor's going to have a four-week revival. Come on now. Well, I can't get there on time every time, so you show up a half hour late. Man, when you first got saved, you were a half hour early. And I know that this is, this is the last sermon. This is the last big sermon of the year on a Sunday morning. I'm going to get you. Uh-huh. What's that old song? I got you. Uh-huh. Thought I didn't see you now, didn't you? All right. <laughs> Some of y'all remember that stupid song, don't you? <laughs> Hallelujah. And so, you know, they come over, and they, you know, and when they get on the other side. Here comes Pharaoh's armies out in the middle of it, and God just, just blows the sea down and just drowns the whole thing there. Some theological seminary professor said one time, he said, oh, that was no big deal. The water was only six inches deep there. My God, he drowned a whole army, horses and all, in six inches of water. The Bible says in the depths of the sea. Six inches ain't the depths, unless you're an ant. Hello? You know, so, you know some people just, 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 just shut up. And, and young people, God put gray matter between your ears to use. Not to let some professor at some college tell you you don't know anything and they know everything because they got Ph.D. Just say post hole digger. Hello? Don't, don't, don't think that they know everything just because they got a degree. Some folks are educated beyond their intelligence. I've met them. I've talked with them. You know, just because they memorized real good, they were able to get through and get that little piece. You know, and I'm not knocking education, but when education supersedes spiritual wisdom and understanding the things of God, it's useless. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Hello? And actually, you can watch, there's a spirit that goes with it. That went over big. I'm, that's right. I've got my master's. I'm not, you know, if I were just sitting there and write a dissertation, I could have my doctorate. But, you know... Um, Brother Bill wants me to get my doctorate. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to get dragon. I'm going to speak my doctorate. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyway. So after they all got drowned in the middle of the sea, we pick up here in Exodus 15. We're going to read 21 verses. We're going to read a lot of Bible reading today because let the Bible tell you a lot of stories here today. All right. 
Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. Remember that song? Well, that's where, this is where it comes from. Hallelujah. The Lord is my strength. My song has become my salvation. He is my God. I will prepare him in habitation. My father is, as, as fathers, that's, that, my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captives are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They were covered. You can't get covered in six inches of water. Hello. They sank into the bottom as a stone. The right hand, o, thy right hand, O God, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, has dashed in, in the pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sendest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as a stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood up as a heap. The depths were congealed. That means frozen. In the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue and I will overtake. Oh, thank God. I said, thank God. The enemy might say, I will pursue and I will overtake. But God's got a plan for the enemy. I said, God's got a plan for the enemy. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Uh, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? I want you to mark that right there. Who is like thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretched forth thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth thy, the people which thou hast redeemed. Excuse me. Hallelujah feeling just a little mound up this morning. Ah, hallelujah. And they're just going to be honest with you. It's got to go this morning. Hallelujah. Woo! Ah, glory. No. All right. Glory to God. Who is like thee among the gods? Who is like thee glorious in holiness? Fearful in praises, doing wonders. Thou stretched forth out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold of the inhabitants of the Pal Palestinian. Anyway. The dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold with them upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. They shall be as uh, still as a stone till thy people pass over. O Lord, I mean, uh, oh, pass over, O Lord, till thy people pass over which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in. In the sanctuary, O Lord. With, with thy hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horse of Pharaoh went into, in with his chariots and with the horsemen into the sea. And the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry ground in the midst of the sea. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, uh, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider hath he thrown into the sea. Now, here they are. What are they doing? They're singing. What are they doing? They're rejoicing. I don't know where the heat's coming from. Something's, it's got to go. I hear it running or something. It's got to go. Anybody warm besides me? I'm warm. If you're not warm, go right, sit right up there, right where Nathan's guitar is. Let that light hit you. You'll get warm. Guarantee it. Hallelujah. They're rejoicing. How many remember when you first got saved? Oh, you had a song of praise. You had a song of victory. I mean, you just, oh, you were excited about God. You were testifying about how good God was. Oh, <clears throat> I mean, you're sold out to the Lord. Amen? I mean, you were just on this path with God. Woo! Glory to God. I'm saved. I mean, you testify. I mean, you can't wait for, for you know, if, you're, if you're Pentecostal, you couldn't wait for the first Wednesday night, te night testimony meeting. 
because you're ready to pop up and join with all everybody else. I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for me that whole truth to the end. Hallelujah. Of course, I messed it up my first one. I did. I want to thank God I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm holding true. If you want to come on, just join me. Not pray for me that I hold true to the end. You know, I, was just, I messed it up. And I got a, little, got a little cocky there. Well, you know, I, I got, you know, you get a revelation when you're young, you get cocky with it. As you mature with it, you understand how to use it properly, not be so cocky. Amen. Amen. I was thinking about this last night. You know, if, if the Pentecostals would have embraced the Southern Baptist soul winning techniques, we'd have gotten a lot more done. Instead of running around thinking, well, we got the Holy Ghost, we, you don't need to listen to you. Well, they know how to get some folks saved. Amen. I mean, my God, you know, they get folks saved. Let's find out how they're getting saved. Let's get them saved. Then get them filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. We don't need to keep going over there getting their people. They get saved and try to get them all filled with the Holy Ghost. Why don't we just go get them saved and get them filled with the Holy Ghost? Amen. Well, that will just leave that one alone. Don't need to be so cocky. Hallelujah. But you know, we come out, we're rejoicing. And for a season, you go in that joy. How many you know what I'm talking about? You just kind of go in this euphoria. It's, it's the, it's the uh, excuse the analogy, but the honeymoon period. Oh, it's all cool. I mean, everything, I mean, it's just, it, it, now, I know this is a really bad analogy, but you know, my, my, uh, Janie's Uncle Mike, my, my father-in-law's brother, used to say, he had a saying, you know, he said, how you doing? He said, good as and not half as dusty. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. They're doing good as stuff and not half as dusty. So, hallelujah. And you were doing good as stuff and not half as dusty. That's not, that's not an okay to go dip, start dipping. Now, <clears throat> and if you've ever seen people's teeth and the stuff running down their jaw, you probably don't want to. Anyway, nasty. Put in the back with them women. They come out to the barn. They had running Mama Rose's snuff. And you're running down the cheek over here. And you know, they, they try to talk to you. And, and, and brown juice running all between your teeth. Now, there's some churches that had the, had the spit tunes in the churches. The Primitive Baptists used to have the, the, the spit tunes right there in the church. I said, now, amen. <laughs> Woo, ain't that, how did I get off on that? So anyway, here they are. They're all excited about God, excited about serving the Lord. Just turned on to the things of God. Get to the first hard place, they're ready to kill Moses. But if you'll study your Bible, they wanted to kill Moses more than they wanted to follow him. So now you pastors, and I, I need to really take this to heart. When people want to stone you, you realize they're just like all the children of Israel. Carnal. Hello. Thank you. But it is true, it's carnal. You know, how many times when people get in a hard place, it's the pastor's fault? Same thing happened, as soon as they got in a hard place, it was Moses' fault. Hello. Then you had leaders rise up. God talks to me just as much and split churches. I'm going to tell you something. If what happened to Miriam and Aaron happened to the people, uh, associate pastors that split churches, it stopped. First big church had them, I'm supposed to stand up and say, God talks to me too. Leprosy. Hello? And now, the person you were murmuring against and speaking against and being critical against has got to pray for you to get restored. You go study it. Moses had to pray intercession for her to get, to, but she had to spend seven days outside with leprosy before God let her back in. And, you know, and listen, God didn't, and God didn't argue with them about the fact he spoke to them also. He just said, yeah, I speak to you, but I speak to Moses face to face. You know what he just told them? You ain't all that. There's a lot of you ain't all that today. And so Israel comes out, you know, and, and, they, and they get to a, rock, a tough place. The waters are bitter, and God, you know, they start murmuring, and they murmur, and, and they just murmur, murmur, murmur. Then Moses go up into the mountain for 40 days. He's up in the mountain for 40 days. Took them 40 days after him going up in the mountain. Just up in the mountain. 40 days! And they backslide. I ain't talking about sliding back just a little bit. 
Them folks went to whoring and harlotting and worshiping false gods and wishing they'd gone back to Egypt. Hello. Now they just got through singing. The Lord has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. Forty days later, oh God, I wish we could go back to Egypt. I want to tell you something, folks. Egypt ain't all that. Amen. Now go back and think about what it was like when you were in the world. When you were drunk, when you were high, when you were womanizing, when you were whoring around. I don't know how else to say it. I mean, you know, I guess we could dress it up a little bit. Skank it around. Anyway. I guess they're about the uh, same. Hello? When life was tough, when life was rough, when you had no hope, you had no joy, there were no answers in life. And you want to go back to that? Man, I remember when I could drink and it was okay. You were miserable. That's why you were drinking. Amen. You were getting high. Why? Because you were miserable. You were dropping pills. Why? Because you were miserable. You were running around trying to be with somebody all the time, you know, and, and have sex all the time. Why? Because you were just miserable. You're looking for answers. And then you found Jesus. You came out of Egypt. He delivered you with a strong arm. He delivered you from drugs and alcohol. He delivered you from the sin of this world. Run to a tough place and you're ready to run back. Egypt ain't all that. What you left behind, there's a reason you left it behind. Hello? But I am telling you today that if you do not stop allowing your soul to be vexed daily, like Lot and Lot's wife. Remember the Bible says Lot's soul was, his righteous soul was vexed daily. So much so. And you think of how perverted his, his thinking became by living and, and, and engaging in and living next to sin. And came, although he went in as a righteous man, after a certain period of time there, finally when the, when, the, when the men of the city came to try to get the angels to have relationships with them, this man offered them his daughters. You come to my house, get my daughters, and uh, we got a little thing called a scoop. <laughs> Heard us the number one deterrent sound in the country. It's a pump shotgun. You come out to my doors, and what's left will be dragged out in the body bag. Hello. And you're not going to get my daughters. And if I got a guest in my house, and you come and say, I want the guest, you ain't getting them, but you ain't getting my daughters either. Talking about the perverseness, what happened? His soul got vexed. By living next to that sin and, 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 this, and yielding to that sin and not letting sin be next to him all that time. And it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Now we got teachings in the church that tell you it doesn't matter. You're under grace. Not everybody teaches that way, but there's enough of them teaching it that way. Amen. And there's enough belief out there that way. Somebody's got to stand up and say, I ain't right. Amen. Well, if you'll just teach them that they're under God's grace, they won't want to do that. Hogwash! you got to teach what the Bible says on both sides of the issue. Amen. You cannot vex your righteous soul daily and expect to have a righteous mind when you need it. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, Receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to say the same word so the, that we use when talking about being born again, but the word has a bigger meaning than that. It also means it brings a restoration to the soul, a renewing to the mind. See, your, your soul doesn't get born again. Your soul gets restored. Your, your, your pneuma gets born again. Your spirit gets born again. When James says, receive the meat, with the meekness and grafted word of God, which is able to save your soul, he was writing to the church because he tells us in the first chapter he's writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. He's writing to the church. He's writing to people of, of the kingdom. He's writing to men and women of faith. Amen. Because of my brethren... 
Then tells them to receive with me. It's the engrafted word which they would to say, or sozo, restore the soul. So I'm going to read to you out of Nehemiah chapter 9. The entire chapter, which is 30-some verses. So this is going to take a while. 38 verses. Two and a quarter pages. Out of my Kenneth E. Hagan special edition study Bible. Just in case you, you've been told that, that, that he added to the Bible. You, yeah, that, was a, that was a demonized liar that told you that mess. Lots of people put study notes in the Bible. The little concordance things in the middle. The chapter and verse symbols are added to the Bible. People went all over Europe telling me, they say, if, if you see me somebody with a Hagen or Copeland Bible, they added to it. What about Schofield's? He added study notes. Hello. So they, and they showed him the verse where it says, if any man adds to or takes away, let him be a curse of Nephemiah. That's a study Bible. They didn't, they didn't change the Bible part. They added notes and did not say they were canon. People, people can be full of the devil. So here in Nehemiah, they restored, remember they restored the wall, restored the breach of the wall, they finished building it. And after they did that, then they started having, you know, re reinducing certain ceremonies and then readings of the Bible. And here's one of these days. So now on the 20th and 4th day of the month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting, with sackcloth and earth upon them, or you know, like we say sackcloth and ashes. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all the strangers and stood confessing their sins and iniquities of their fathers. They stood up in their place to read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one-fourth of the part of the day. The other fourth part, they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. So they took, you know, um, well, six hours and read the Bible. They took six hours to confess the sins of the people. Amen. And then they stood up at the uh, stairs, and they just go and listen to all these uh, different things. Verse 5 down here in the middle. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Thou, even thou art Lord alone, and hast made heaven and, uh, and the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth, and all the things that are in the seas, and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the hosts of heaven worshipeth thee. There's a reason I'm reading all this. Thou art the Lord God, which did choose Abram, and brought him forth out of the earth of the Chaldees, and gave him the name Abraham. And found us his heart faithful before thee, and made, a, uh, made us a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzarites, the Jebusites, the uh, Gergashites, I, uh, to give them, I say this day, and hast performed thy words, for thou art righteous. And didst see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt, remember they were 400 years, and hurts their cry by the Red Sea, and showed signs and wonders unto Pharaoh, and on all his servants, and all the people of the land, for they knew us that they dealt proudly against him, so thou didst get a name as it is this day. Thou didst divide the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land, uh, dry land and their uh, persecutors that uh, thou threwest into the depths as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, thou lettest them in the day by a cloudy pillar, and the night by a pillar of fire, to give them light in the way wherein they should go. Thou camest down upon the Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them the right judgments, the true laws, good statutes, and commandments, and made known them thy holy Sabbath and commandments, thy precepts, statutes, and laws, by the hand of Moses thy servant, gave them bread from heaven for the hunger, brought us forth water um, out of the rock for them their thirst, and promised them they should go into the possess the land which thou hast sworn to them. But they and our fathers dealt proudly and hearken, hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments. And they refused to obey. Now, let's stop right here. Now, I remember, I've told you this number of times. I'm reading somebody was blogging about how they were under grace and they don't have to obey. They don't have to give. They don't have to submit. They just went on and on and on and on and on and on. They didn't obey. Now, didn't we share with us last Wednesday night and then last, I mean, last Sunday and Sunday night how that God told Moses that when he took his son to the mount to kill him, he said, because you obeyed my voice, I'm going to do this. Yes. Now, I don't understand why people are teaching you don't have to obey. But I'm telling you, we obey. Yeah. I'll just lay down. If you look at the finished work of Jesus, I don't have to do anything. I'm sorry, you have to obey. I don't care when anybody teaches you that, you know, Mo, uh, Abraham was a father of our faith. We follow after the faith of Abraham. And God said, because you obeyed my voice, I'm going to do this. Amen. That's right. We obey God's voice. If God says, caps, sell everything you got and move to China. And you say, I'm laying down looking at the finished work of Jesus. I don't even have to go to China. You're living in disobedience to God. No, and then people come along and say, no, you're under grace. That's works for him to go. No, it's not works. You have to obey God. Not only do you have to obey his, vo his, his voice, you have to obey his written word. As a matter of fact, you obey his written word over a voice. You go there first. That would never be. 
They refused to obey, neither were they mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them. They hardened their necks, and in their rebellion, listen, listen to this verse, listen to this. And in their rebellion appointed a captain to return their, to their bondage. The Amplified says, our Bible says, to return them to their bondage in Egypt. I'm not going to finish this morning. My goodness. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness and forsook them. Now, I'm going to have to stop right here and pick up and, and, and get to this point. Because, my Lord, how did time get away from us so fast? Notice that they got rebellious. I'm telling you, one of the things that happens to Christians is they go along for a season, then all of a sudden they think they know everything. They know more than the pastor. They got a better grip on it than anybody. They're wiser. They got the best techniques. They got the best plans. They know exactly what to do. They know everything. And then all of a sudden, the Egypt that they came out of starts looking cool. Why can't I do that anymore? Why can't I do this anymore? Why can't I, you know, uh, why can't I just go smoke some weed like I used to before I got saved? It's all right. Uh, you know, I, I want to I drink, you know, some, some liquor. I, I, uh, you know, we got churches now. This church, there's a church here in this city. Advertisers on their website. Now listen, it's one thing, you know, the kind of, kind of people say, you know what, we, I don't really see it clear in the Bible, um, you know, whatever. But, you know, you know, make it a matter of conscience. We're just not going to promote it and we're not going to support it. Put it on the website. We drink wine. Now what is this? Why don't you say we smoke dope? Well, there are is the Rastafarians. <laughs> hey, man, he's a, you know, he's a, he's a, got the lion, the tribe of Judah, hair here, I'm smoking some dope, man, huh? <laughs> man, when I smoke the dope, I get in close with God. <laughs> yes, you do. His name is Beelzebub. Anyway. We start looking back. All of a sudden, you reach that place where things aren't happening like they were at the very beginning. You're not having a miracle every day. God's not, you know, not delivering you out of this, delivering you out of that. You've been removed by time from the place where you once remember what it was like to be in Egypt. And now all of a sudden, because you've kind of gone down the road and you had to give up your smoking and you had to give up your drinking and you had to give up your spitting. I'm talking about spitting stuff. You had to give up, you know, your alcohol, you had, you know, all these kind of things because you were serving the Lord and it wasn't right. You didn't think, or the church said it wasn't right. And now you come along and think, man, I want to drink again. Let me tell you something, there's a danger. The pull of Egypt will pull you back, not just to the things you think you could get away with. It'll pull you back into everything. And I knew a guy. A guy was in a church I was in. He ran a restaurant. And he got saved, gave up drinking and everything else. But all of a sudden, you know, uh, you know, when he was in the world, he used to love to have beer with his pizza. Well, he was running a pizza restaurant. And so he thinks, well, you know what? I'll drink near beer. You know, non-alcoholic beer? Suppose it had the flavor with the alcohol removed? He's going to drink near beer. Start drinking near beer. Next, you know what he's drinking next? He started drinking beer. You know what happened next? He backslid. Not serving God. Not coming to church. Drinking all the time. We know a guy uh, in, our, in our home church, and one of the saddest stories you'll ever hear as far as what happened to somebody. He, um, I mean, he, he got in the church, gotten saved. Mary's doing good, serving the Lord. And, uh, all of a sudden, the church starts missing equipment. And he's got, the, he's got the key and the password to the church. All of a sudden, equipment starts getting missing. They put video cameras in. Find out who it is. Guy's stealing the equipment and hawking it out of the church. Well, not long ago, the pastor decided not to press charges. They wouldn't try to minister to him. And I understand. You, you understand you want to be compassionate to people and you want to try to help them. On the other hand, sometimes, you know, it's, it's, what's the best thing to do? You know, it wasn't too long after that. He was, on the, he was on the television station with a camera on him. I'm a minister. I'm a minister. I'm a minister. Because they were arresting him. He had robbed a church in another town 10 miles away and shot the pastor. And then, then, then begged the guy to forgive me. I, you know, I, 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 I'm a minister. I serve. I, I, I'm a minister. I, what happened? Well, sometime before he had, you know, he used to smoke dope, he used to be hooked on drugs, got delivered, got saved. 
Riding down the road one day, picked up this guy hitchhiking. The guy said, hey, man, you want, you want, some, you want some marijuana? He said, no, man. The guy kind of, kept, he finally, he, you know, he had been going through a little bit of a rough time. I'm telling you, Egypt ain't all that. There are no answers in Egypt to what you're going through today. I said, there are no answers in Egypt to, to, to help you with what you're going through today. That's why you got out of there. That's why you left there. And I'm going to say something else. Just going back and doing the things you used to do cause you, so you can be socially cool with a lot of people. If they're not saved, they're in Egypt. They're Egyptians. You are there to minister to them, not be like them. Amen. Not hang out and be cool with them. You're there to be a light to them. Not to be like them. They need to want to be like you. Well, what happened? So finally, this guy kept kind of, man, you sure? He finally, he finally said, yeah, he, he took one, one hit, took one smoke. And all of a sudden, he turned his life and ran straight into Egypt. I was smoking dope, started, started, uh, started doing some, I think, crystal meth. Started doing some other stuff. Started robbing the church to buy his drugs. Was going up to other towns around the, our, our city that we're from. And going to small towns around there and just holding people up by gunpoint on the street and taking all the money so he could go buy his... And this is a guy who was a minister. He's in jail. Went to jail. I don't know how long he's still in there. He went to jail for a number of years. A minister. Good guy. Loved the Lord. But he listened to the call of Egypt to come back. Got into a tough place. And a God was made. They got them a captain. What did it say here? And they made, listen, they refused to obey. Yes, same thing. They refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy words. And they didst, and thou didst among them. They hardened their necks in rebellion, appointed a captain to return them to the bondage. But thou art God, ready to pardon, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness forsook them not. Verse 18, got to read this one. Yet, or yea, when they made them a molten calf and said, listen to this, this is thy God that brought thee up out of Egypt and hath wrought great provocations. What did they sing in, in, back there with Moses? I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Now they're saying this golden calf, the gods of Egypt is what delivered me. When you start looking back into Egypt with a longing, when you start making provision, what does what is, what is the New Testament say? We are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. There are no answers in Egypt, my brother and sister. There's no help in the drugs, the alcohol, the smoking, the shooting up, the sex, all the stuff in the world. There's no, there's no answers there. Egypt is a lie. Sin has pleasure for a season. And there's even a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Literally destruction. Egypt bids you come back. There's nothing there. It just ain't all that. And so he, he, got, he got where he was doing all this stuff. <clears throat> and finally... When he shot the pastor <coughs> and robbed, robbed the church and begged the guy to forgive him. <clears throat> While he was robbing it, telling them that he was a minister and ran out the door. Now one man got called and they chased him and he, he drove back to our church, our home church there. And was running there, you know. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, when you get into that place between the worlds of walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh and walking in, walking in Egypt and trying to walk in... You know, Trying to walk in Canaan land and trying to walk in Egypt at the same time, you can't be done. We tried to go back to the, his haven of our church. They called him and arrested him. He's telling people, no television crew, I'm a minister. Because what happened? His spirit wanted to serve God, but he let Egypt take control of his thinking and his flesh off of one. The pool pulled him right back in. You don't know all that you need to know. You're not more whatever than the pastor. 
I've got, I got it figured out better than the pastor. No, you don't. Why? Because I'm anointed to do what I'm doing. You might have more knowledge than I got, but I got the anointing to do what I'm doing. And that's the factor that separates everything. When I'm outside the anointing, you might know more than me. But the minute I step into the role as pastor and the anointing's on me, then that's, that's just, I'm above everything. Not me, the anointing on me. It's, it, that is what's ministering to you, not Ed Taylor. The anointing's ministering to you. Well, I got you. You may think you got to figure it out. We might sit and have a discussion. And in the natural, you might, have a, you might have more arguments than I got in the natural. But I'm telling you, the minute I step into the anointing, the anointing's got more anything, anything than you got. Well, I'm anointed too. Yeah, th- don't watch that, Miriam. If, I'm, if I am the, set as the head, or any pastor set at the head in their ministry, in the church, and they're anointed to do that, they're anointed to do that, then they're the Moses. And you might be anointed to do things, but you're Miriam and Aaron. Watch what you say and how you handle yourself. Hello? And I'm going to say something. I know this, but I'm, I'm old enough to say this and get away with it. I'm not a 28-year-old whippersnapper who just got out of school or something, thinking I know everything. I've been down the road a few times. I'm double nickels. I'm at least the, minor, low, the low speed limit. You don't have the same anointing I have. God anointed me to be the pastor. And with that came an anointing to stand in a certain place and to speak with certain authority. I didn't choose that. He chose me. I, I mean, listen, quite frankly, if it was my choice, I'd be doing something else. I'd be sitting in a room with a computer screen and having burnt CRTs on my eyeballs writing programs. Computers don't talk back to you. And if they do, you can turn them off. Hello? I got a smart computer. Yep, click, you're off. You know, like that, I can just unplug you. You're off. I can't unplug you. You talk back, I got to deal with it. But what I'm saying is that, you know, God chose Moses. Now think about it. Moses was probably not the most, he was not the most eloquent of speech man. He stuttered. He had a speech impediment. As a matter of fact, Aaron actually did the talk while Moses stood there. But when it came to God talking to Aaron, Miriam, and Moses, God talked to Moses face to face. Let me put it to you in language you understand. He was the big dog. You watch out for that spirit of Miriam that comes on people that say, God talks to me too. That's never, that's never an argument about that. But the attitude behind it, that he talks to me too, and I got the right to say what I want to say and how I think it ought to be done. And if you don't do it the way I want it done, I'm leaving and going somewhere else. Now I'm going to say something. You better watch it because we're coming into the end of the age and there's going to be less, less, less latitude to walk in rebellion and murmuring than there has been. We need to get the right heart. We need to get our eyes off of going back to Egypt. We need to shut the door on the voice of Egypt and get our eyes on the purposes of God. And I'm saying this because I love you. God, listen, this is not a message I made up. God gave me the message. I didn't sit around, I'm going to get these people this week. God woke me up and I'm laying there minding my own business and he gave me this. Thinking, Lord, why don't you give me one of the messages that everybody just runs in and just throws money all over the place? I really don't think that. It'd be nice to have the money to do things we need to do, which we are, we're coming into that. We're coming in, we're a base. We're coming out of debt. Finances are coming in. Extra, more people are coming in to get the job done. We've got things to do. But it won't be done because we compromised. It won't be done because we sold out to a, a message that tickled people's ears. It'll be done because the Lord brought the people and we did what we were supposed to do. And in obedience to that, God honored it. We went through the, we've gone through the tough places. My God, we've gone through the tough places. But Egypt is not your answer. 
You come into the church, you get saved, you get turned on to the Lord, serving God, and all of a sudden you're thinking, it's all right just to go back and do all the things I used to do before I got saved. Why? Well, last, last, my last trip to Estonia, which has been a few years now, a number of years now, the, the, all the guys, I went around and preached for people I taught in Bible school the very first year they got, man, they were so excited about God. It was right after communism had fallen, they started the Bible school. These people were so turned on to God. I mean, they just loved the Lord. I mean, when I, I'd preach, they, I mean, they'd come out of the windows of the other units in this office complex, and really, they say office complex. It was built, this building is 600 years old. We're in the old town square. And they had the windows open because the heat, you know, one heat, had put heat in, radiator heat, and it was running off of the whole thing, and it got hot. You had, the only way to cool it off was open the windows. And I'm preaching like a crazy man. See, Estonians aren't like that, weren't like that anyway. And they're coming out on the, 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 the balconies of the other office or, or whatever they turn in offices on the other side, which is about 30 feet, t- waving, telling them to be quiet over here. And I thought they'd been, preach harder, preach harder. <laughs> yeah, glory to God. I went for it some more. I think finally God went like this and walked back in and went, Preach for yeah, yeah, glory. <laughs> I went back the last time I was there, going around with the different ones and going and, and ministering in their churches. Went, went and ministered to one church, and one of the guys that was one of the students went back to his house with his wife and stuff at, afterwards, and we're sitting there, and, and all of a sudden he starts going, what do you think about drinking wine? Their whole mantra all they had become, all they wanted to talk about, all they wanted to preach on, all they wanted to talk about when they got together was, was it okay to drink wine? Because they wanted to drink wine. That's all they could think about. Egypt's calling you. Not just wine, other things. I'm just saying this, this was what their, their big deal was. Now they don't preach faith. They, take, they teach that faith was, was out of balance. They, they don't, they, these are people who, who were on fire for God turned on to the things of God. And now they've gotten intellectual about that faith stuff. And they've backed off of it. And they just teach people it's okay to drink wine. And all i got to ask you is a question is this, why? What is so awesome that you've got to do that to smoke, drink wine, whatever. And, and let me say something here. I'm going to do a better study of it. I did a, a real quick study of it uh, yesterday. All things are lawful for me and all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me and all things are not profitable. It is not all things. It's written in context of something other than all things. So people use that as, everything's lawful to me. Well, not really. You've got to read what it was written to. You know, uh, murdering people is not lawful. When he said all things, it was written within the parameters of, another, of, of a discussion. And it was talking about me offered the idols. Go study it. That section is in reference to meat offered to idols and whether you should eat it or not. It had nothing in the stinking world to do with you could enter into vices and it was okay because all things are lawful. That is, that is a sorry exegesis and a sorry Bible student who does that. We've got to be better Bible students than to take things on the surface and use them to support our flesh. Egypt ain't all that, honey. There's nothing there that you left it's worth going back for. Had Adam just got rid of Eve, God could have used the other rib and even them back up. <laughs> Are you here? He gave up his estate. Hello? Are y'all here? God could have put them back out, taken another rib. Hello? There's nothing you've left. Think about it. How many have ever had a pull? Don't, don't raise your hand. How many have ever had a pull to go back to things that you left behind because you thought, well, you know, I could really go do that. That's okay. 
you know, God don't care if I do this, do that. I think we ought, instead of trying to figure out what we can go back and live in, we ought to be seeing how far we can get away from. And how close to the Lord we can get. I'm as close as I can get. He's on this. And now listen, folks, that, those are little cute sayings we give that don't really bear the truth. Because the New Testament says, draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto thee, says the Lord. He may be living in you. You may be the temple of the Holy Ghost, but he has a lot of things, a lot of things to say about what you do with that temple. And I'm going to have to wait until next week to do it because I, I can't finish it this morning or we'll be here till 4 o'clock. And, 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 and I don't know if we're going to finish it on, on Tuesday night because usually we reserve that night for one, but I may finish it Tuesday night. I don't know. But he's just not all that. The Spirit of God, there's a voice going out into the church today, and there's th- people, a lot of people rising up, and they're beginning to speak. Hello? And people are beginning to say, you know what, this is wrong, we shouldn't be doing this, we shouldn't be living like this, there's, this, is, this is out of balance, this is an error. We can't keep doing this and expect God to move in the church. People are beginning to realize that the watering down of the truth of the gospel and giving people liberty to live any way they want to live and to do anything they want to do under the guise that, that God doesn't care is hurting people and not helping them. Amen. Don't spank your children. That teaches them to hit. If, you, if you've got Spock's book, burn it. It is an anti-Christ book. It is not a godly book. His position on child rearing is totally anti-scripture. Your children are to be your friend. No, your children are my, uh, are my charge to train in the ways of God. Now, when they grow up and they're adults, we may have a friendly relationship, but I'm still their father. And there's going to be wisdom and answers that I have as the, as the patriarch of their life from heaven that I grow in. When I'm 70, I'm going to be smarter than I am now. I'm going to have more wisdom in the spirit than I do now. They might be 40, but I'm still going to have wisdom. Doesn't mean that I, they won't have any, but I'll have more than I had. Don't, don't spank your children. The Bible says if you spare the rod, you hate your child. Spock says you teach them to hit. Who are you going to listen to? Some guy named after the pointy-eared guy or, somebody, or the Bible? It's a joke. Hello? Don't break their spirit. The rod of correction drives rebellion far from the heart of the child. You need to break that spirit that's rebellious. If it's rebellious, it's got to be broken. It'll cause them trouble and misery later in life. Then, then I just, we just found out, we, uh, you know, that the Army now has stress cards for boot camp. Yes, you get a red card when you go to boot camp. And if the sergeant gets in your face and you get stressed, you hold it up because you're stressed. And he has to back off. Oh, no, we're not kidding. Are we kidding? They're doing the Air Force for years. I'm stressed. The United States Weenie Air Force, United States Weenie Army. What are we doing? I know Darius is not a weenie. Yeah. Huh? No red cards. He knows a drill, drill sergeant at the Army uh, told him, well, was a former drill sergeant. I'm stressed. <laughs> if you did that 30 years ago, and you're going to be more stressed. <laughs> Grunt. <laughs> Joe, can you imagine pulling out a red card in boot camp? Now, y'all going to go home now and remember the thing I preached. They remember the red card in the, in the Army boot camp.
This is what happens when you try, try, you try to follow social experimentation from intelligentsia who don't know what their head from a hole in the ground in, in different areas of life. We can't listen to them. We've got to listen to the Bible. And the Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. So we're to act like the church and not try to act like the world. We've got to be like the world to win the world. Hogwash. Baloney. Bunk and Tommy Rot. And a few other things. There's nothing in Egypt that you need in your life right now. It just ain't all that. The image that Satan paints of Egypt, they loved you more in the world than they do in the church. That is so cockamamie full of it. And you've seen the world. Hey, guys and girls, they're in love. They break up, the girl comes to school that morning, breaks up with them at 8 o'clock, by 12 o'clock, they hate each other. I hate him. I hate her. They make up. I love them. Break up a few weeks later. I hate them. And everybody joins in. Then you're picking sides. Anyway. That's how the world is. Well, the world loved me. No, they didn't. They wouldn't come to your house because you always provided the beer. You bought the fight on pay-per-view. You threw a good party. Where were they the day that you came over and you said, I'm saved, I don't drink anymore? Where were they then? Did they come back over when you didn't have the keg? Did they come back over when you didn't, throw, didn't pay the, pay the, buy the pay-per-view so they could watch the fight at home? All of a sudden, they disappeared, didn't they? Were they really your friend? They just liked what you provided. And you're going to go back to that? Well, somebody in the church hurt me. Man up. Woman up. Get a little tougher skin about those things. People have problems. And you've got people in the church who aren't perfect. Amen. How do you know? Because you're here. <laughs> perfect neither am i if any of us walk into a room of people perfection left because nobody's perfect but i can tell you the answers are not back in the things you used to do the answer is not back in how you used to live when you gave your heart to jesus christ you gave it to him because you were tired of that mess and now all of a sudden it looks better because you went through a little tough time on this side. The waters were bitter. Hello? Your leader was gone for 40 days. And we'll finish next time. Amen? Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for this time together. We're not going to... Say this with me. Say, Egypt just ain't all that. It doesn't hold my answers. God holds my answers. Hallelujah. Amen.